Thank you, Joe. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. All right. <laughs> well, thanks for the introduction, Joe. Actually, um, also thanks for giving me my very first speaking engagement at Windwriters in 2000, so <laughs> in Seattle, but no less. So I'm really glad to be back. Um, really excited to be here and uh, honored to speak in, in, in this conference and part of this great stellar lineup that you have going. Uh, welcome to the C Seattle Central Public Library. It's a fantastic venue. I think uh, definitely uh, a place to do more of these, uh, these talks. So um, if you're here, though, for preschool story time or computer basics, this is not the talk. <laughs> uh, that is elsewhere, actually, Elliot. Um, Elliot Graff from Microsoft forwarded me this. He said, I couldn't find your session on the public library schedule. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Although I, I did find one thing quite interesting, which is the, um, the, the notion that to start with a computer, you need practice with a mouse and keyboard, and by no ma means to mean to rag on the library. But it is interesting now with all the devices that we, we have that that is not necessarily the case anymore. I mean, you have Surface, we have a Chromebook, Pixel, I brought one. Uh, these are touch devices, touch and keyboard. Um, of course, all the mobile devices, tablets and phones. So that's becoming, um, of course, they'll be around for a long time, but not necessarily forever. Great, so a quick introduction. Uh, Joe pretty much summed it all up, so I'm not gonna bore you with the details. I'm a bit of an HTML5 uh, enthusiast or nut, you might say. Uh, that's my license plate. I should have washed my car when Guy Kawasaki drove by and took a nice picture. <laughs> <laughs> right, so uh, you can follow me on Twitter, at Peter Lubbers. Uh, also, if you tweet, we have uh, convey UX as the hashtag for the whole conference. So, all right, so without further ado, I just wanted, so we only have about 40 minutes, 45 minutes to, to talk. Um, do we still have that much time? Yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> or did it come out of my budget? <laughs> so uh, there's a lot going on in HTML5. And any of these areas, and this is not even half of it, could be a 40 minute talk. So I'm, I'm going to do a lot of, not too many, I mean there will be slides, but mostly demos, showing you some of these cool features. Uh, I'll be around after the talk, so if there's anything specific that you say, well, I didn't quite get how you did that, or I'm not gonna dig into the, the deep guts of the code behind some of these things uh, in here, but I'm happy to talk more about that and uh, have a lot of resources. And I'll make these slides available, obviously, to, uh, so you can uh, look at the demos in more detail. So before we dive into um, HTML5, how many of you are working with HTML5 on a daily basis or uh, quite frequently. Okay, so a, a good number. Um, but so it helps to maybe take one step back and say what, what exactly is HTML5? And there's different definitions of HTML5. Um, some people like to be very focused on exactly what's in the spec, the W3C and the what working group specs. Other people like to paint a little broader picture. So often you'll find HTML5 as a sort of catch-all umbrella term for new and exciting features on the web. Uh, that's more the camp that I'm in because I don't think it helps very much uh, to, to be so specific. That's, that's great if you're a spec author or if you're working with specific details. You, we all know that CSS is not part of the HTML spec, yet you do need CSS HTML and JavaScript for building a, a modern web application. So HTML5 as that sort of umbrella term, as we'll talk about, has a, a lot of different feature areas. And there are things like the markup. There's uh, offline and storage. There's uh, real-time con communication. Uh, media. There's CSS3. There's integration and performance aspects to it. So all of these have um, received the cryptic little icon, as you'll see here. Uh, <laughs> you don't need to memorize these, but uh, also device access. Uh, it, it, it's sort of an explosion of new features, something that really started in 2004, but it took several years before that to actually materialize in browsers, and now 
is really um, a lot of that early wave of new features, things like the semantic markup, um, a lot of the communication APIs and storage. That's all in most modern browsers today. And that's really exciting. So it's a, it's a great time to be in web design, web development today. So I've picked the areas that I've found most um, to have the most impact on the user experience, the, the user experience you're building, whether that be uh, a website, a web application, or, or in some way related to the web. These, there are a couple of features that are already landed and some that are going to land pretty soon that will make a big impact. And it's definitely taking your web experiences from the static, sort of static web page to a, a very rich, immersive experience, or it can be. And I'll try to share some demos of that. But before we do, kind of a good idea to also be realistic and see, well, okay, where, you know, in which browsers does all of this cool stuff work? And there are a couple of great resources. One is called Can I Use, so caniuse.com. It's a great site where you can say, okay, I want to use WebSocket. Which browser support it? And you'll get an exact uh, big table, including the mobile browsers. And another site that uh, some of us are really uh, passionate about, we've been working on this for a while now, is called Web Platform Docs, webplatform.org. How many of you have heard of webplatform.org? <laughs> okay, not, not so many. Um, so definitely check it out. Uh, it's, um, it's a cross browser, even beyond uh, effort. It's, um, you, you can go there with uh, it's webplatform.org. Uh, docs.webplatform.org has all of the documentation of all the things, uh, sort of the, the canonical reference site for web developers. It's in alpha state right now, so it's not completely finished, but it's a wiki. What's really cool about that is everyone can create an account, and within a few minutes, you can be editing the documentation. So think of, for example, MDN or MSDN, HTML5 rocks, all of these sites that different browser vendors had by themselves, and all now teaming up to so all the major browser vendors, uh, Nokia, Facebook, Adobe, HP, all of them got together and said, let's build one site where this is uh, located, and something that can be edited and really be improved uh, as a whole. So we actually have uh, technical writers at Google primarily working on editing documents here, or, or first creating documents on web platforms. So really exciting site, I definitely uh, urge you to check it out. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about markup and forms, and that's an area that has uh, actually a lot of, I mean, that's very solid. You can actually use it as, as far back as IE6 with a couple of minor uh, tweaks to your HTML. This is something you can really use today. And um, one of the core design principles of HTML5 is to, as they say, pave the cow paths. Uh, that means that if everybody is doing and designing and developing certain things sort of the hard way, then why don't we just give them the easy way? So an example would be, um, well, let me just give you this example here. Uh, in the past, everyone was creating sections of their pages using div elements. And then they would give it a, a header class. So at a certain point, uh, people from Opera and people from Google uh, started doing searches and, and figuring out how many people were actually using a header ID or class to style up a header. And guess what? That was a, a lot of people. <laughs> and it's like, well, why don't we just Create a header element, <laughs> simple. And you know, it's the same for an aside and articles and, and um, sections and, and so on. And there's a whole bunch of these new elements. And that's not something really new, but uh, what is exciting is the adoption. And this is some data that I, uh, you're one of the first to see that. Uh, we're actually just starting to now share some of the HTML5 element adoption based on the Google search index. Um, so we're seeing a pretty, you know, a pretty good uptake of these elements. I mean, there's lots and lots of sites that are starting to use things like the header and footer. So it's, it's a promising sign that people are actually slowly starting to adopt this content. And of course, keep in mind that this doesn't reach behind uh, like, like login 
uh, site. So this is basically just on the, on the public internet. So it's really cool to see something that really, a few years ago, it was just an idea, and it's now becoming a reality. Uh, another example of paving the cow paths is, for example, um, different input type, different form inputs. Well, you may have an email address, and everybody has that on their site. They enter your email address or enter your uh, birth date. So in the past, you would have this code. It was a text input. And then you write in JavaScript this super complex regular expression to actually check whether that field, that the input that they've entered, is in fact a, a valid email address. So that's complicated, right? And But everybody is doing that. So now HTML5, so basically scratch that top one, and all you need to do in HTML5 is an example of how simplified the markup is. And somebody just before the, the conference, uh, the session started, said, well, I'm fam really familiar with HTML4. How hard is it to get into HTML5? I'm actually, in many cases, it's a lot simpler. Now you just say form, input, type equals email, and that's it. In fact, you can even, in, in your CSS, style things. So if you see the bottom, the CSS declarations there, I can say foo at bar. See, now this is a valid email address, and it becomes green. I'm not sure how well that displays on the screen. But you can see that, again, you're not constantly in JavaScript polling the, the, the page, checking to see every character gets typed in. This is handed directly into the browser. So it's, there's nothing left to do except that's the style I want and that's the type of um, input I want. One thing that, that happens, though, is if a browser does not support these new input types, they will fall back to the default input type, which is always text. So it's actually, you're not going to have a loss of features, but it'll not be as nice. In fact, this presentation is completely written, actually, this little section here. That's what you just saw. And I can just change this to color, refresh the page. Now I have a color picker, right? So this is all part of HTML5. Uh, very easy to use. I can change, type it to range. And now I have color and a range. Now, here, so I have an email address that I can slide around. <laughs> 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 right. But the, the, you get the point. It's, it's, it's a simplification. It's paving those cow paths is a real good example of uh, of HTML5, and um, the nice thing that you get with these email, or these different inputs, not just email, is um, a mobile device may give you a virtual keyboard. Now I have the at sign there. I don't have to toggle multiple levels deep in text. Also, one thing I didn't show you, let me just go back one slide, and I'll have to fix this again. So one thing, that you see here, if I type in foo, and I, the browser gives me this natively as a sort of built-in widget, if you will, said, please enter a valid email address. But that message is actually translated in all different languages that this browser is translated in. So I don't need to do any of that work. So it, it's like benefits across the board with this kind of uh, simplification. OK. OK. So we have that. Uh, the, the, the mobile support, the, the translations, and all of that. And again, you can see in the, the percentages here are different. They're not the same levels of percentage. But for email, it's really picking up. Uh, we're also planning to make the other inputs available uh, over time. So we're, we're doing some uh, periodic reviews of how, how many people are using these things. And we're seeing some pretty good adoption. And we're, we're going to share that from the, the Chrome developers uh, Google Plus page. Another really cool example, one of my personal favorites, is this uh, details element. Uh, here's a, a details element. So here, if you click it, it e expands and contracts. So very simple stuff. You can see that in the HTML code, I mean, you don't have to be um, a hardcore HTML wizard to write this kind of stuff. It's very, very simple code. You can put in a ton of information in that 
sort of the hidden section and only make it appear when, when you need it. So that, I, I love this for documentation projects. In fact, I used it um, in a, the previous company I worked at called Kazing. Uh, we had a, a setup guide and actually this recently uh, won uh, an STC um, award of merit for uh, use of this concept. Uh, like we have things like how do I unpack a zip file? Well, 99% of your users is going to be completely familiar with unzipping a file. But just for those couple of people that don't, then I have all this information that I, I want to give people, but I don't want to clutter up uh, my, my simple six-step installation process. So this is, you see it slightly different, um, different representation here. You have a very simple styling. but. In CSS, you can access, as you can see here, when the details are open, I give it a border, all of those kinds of things you can easily uh, attach and make it uh, very pretty. Okay. Now, another element, and this is something you may not have heard of yet, uh, this is pretty much just brand new, and this only landed in Chrome uh, Canary uh, uh, like a week or so ago. This is a template element. What's really cool about template elements is it's part of sort of the larger picture of what we call web components. A template element is an element that you can reuse later as, you know, as a template, um, as the name implies. But what's nice is you can define, for example, images. Here you can see an image. The source is not set to anything. Typically, if you have something like that in your, in your HTML code, this would error out. Right, you would get a 404 not found in this particular, or well, in this case, no image. A template works differently. The, the browser will parse that, but it won't, it will sort of keep it there for later. And then in, with a few lines of JavaScript, you can append these templates to your, to your running code. And what's really cool about that is that Let's see here, I'll show you an example of it. So here is, a, is that example in action. This is on HTML5 Rocks, a great article about templates by Eric Beidelman. You can, of course, this is fairly simple, but as you insert these, you can insert the name or the image with the right reference in it. So it's, it's a pretty cool new concept to build uh, reusable objects in your code and, and literally just put them in your template. You can use HTML and CSS styling and uh, reuse it later. So it's basically parsed but not executed. So scripts are not run until you really need that. So quite a, quite a cool feature and this just landed. I'm actually demoing it here in Chrome Canary because it wasn't working in the other builds yet. So. Okay. All right. So I want to talk a little bit about other Part. So the, that was sort of the core markup and forms. Uh, HTML5 also defines a rich set of graphics that you can use for uh, enhancing your experiences. Now, here's one that, that you may have seen. It's a, what we call a Chrome experiment. Let me just um, put this in here. This is using uh, WebGL. So it's basically a, a complete mapping of the solar system. So it's, it's not just fun because it's also pretty educational. And here you have, so the, you can sort of zoom in to this, uh, this galaxy here and then you, know, you get information about specific, um, spe specific stars. So as opposed to reading this in let's say a Wikipedia article or, or in, a, in, a, in just straight text, you have now this very immersive experience. And you can keep zooming in. So. Things like that are now becoming possible in uh, using the, the different types of what we call canvas. So there's a, a two-dimensional canvas as well as a three-dimensional canvas uh, using the WebGL. And then this, you can see that you can tilt these sideways as well in your browser. So this is all uh, done in HTML5 without any plugins, right? So that's the, the big benefit here is not that this wasn't possible before, but this might not have been possible using just standard web technologies. Okay. Okay. Here's a, one that I personally enjoy quite a bit. Is, um, you can take 
with HTML5, there's uh, several device access APIs. And these device access APIs allow you to get access to your, uh, your geolocation coordinates, or they might give you uh, camera access or microphone access. In this case, I'm taking the, the, the camera access, the stream from the get camera, the, the get user media that is called, so I can take the input from the camera and actually push it into a canvas. Now in canvas, in a two-dimensional canvas, you actually have complete pixel level control. You can uh, get the, the RGB and A values for every single pixel. What's really cool about that is I can determine you know, where shapes are. Like I can I figure out the edges of a, a hand or a, a head, and I can detect faces and hands and so on, and then I can overlay that back on to the stream. So that's what it's happening here. Let me show you. I get a little echo here. So. All right. So for camera access, clearly that's not something you want every website to just get whenever they want that. So the browsers will put a little privacy uh, prote protection here and say, do you want this site to do that? And I'll allow that in this case. And now yeah, it will take, take the, the camera, camera feed, and it will detect my hand. So I'm not actually touching anything here. I'm actually able to play this xylophone just with my hands using Canvas, the get user media, and then taking all the data from the canvas very quickly and then overlaying it on the actual part you see and then playing sounds. So I can also do it with my head. <laughs> so pretty incredible experiences that are becoming possible. Uh, also related to the get user media is WebRTC, effectively saying get user media from me and push it over what is called a peer connection to another person and now you have um, you know, web conferencing effectively in the browser. And then you can do things like this and overlay drawings, create whiteboards. So, you know, the, the old static web pages are becoming uh, a thing of the past. This is really pushing the limits of what's possible on the web. And a, a really good example, and I know a lot of you are um, also working on documentation projects and um, this is a project I'm pretty excited about. It's called uh, AnyWorks, and uh, it's built by Gary Davis, and who happened to be in town, so he's here. If, in case you have any questions about this, um, uh, chat with him afterwards, and I'm happy to talk more about it as well. It's really cool. It's a, currently sort of a, a proof of concept of what's possible in animation for documentation. And this was uh, started, uh, Gary worked for Cisco, and so you have a lot of these network diagrams. But you could imagine any other image here. It could be a, a children's story, uh, just the same. And in, if a picture is worth a thousand words, and an animated diagram like this might be worth as many frames as there are in that diagram. And so what's really cool is you can have this more interactive approach. This is all done in pure canvas. So it's completely HTML5. Almost every browser today supports that. There's even polyfills, ways to make it work in older browsers as well. But what's really cool about this is, OK, so we've had that. That's nothing special. But I can actually go in edit mode now. So if I go in edit mode and say, OK, I'm going to add myself a shiny firewall, edit the diagram. I'm going to go into this path mode. And I'm going to change this hacked packet. I'm going to change that to finish right here at the firewall. I'm going to play it again. So now I've actually edited it. Watch that the hacked packet actually stops at the firewall. It's inspected there, and it goes on. It doesn't really matter what the, 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 the concept is here that you're trying to put across. But what's really cool is that the, in, the editing, the player, and, and the path experience is all done in pure HTML5. So if you wanted to add something like this to your document, uh, you, all you would need is basically some graphics, uh, a JavaScript library, and, you know, that, and, and the sort of the JSON object that, that is created here. You could save this out in an edit mode and, and, and keep that. So really uh, creating some in incredible potential here for the user experiences you're after. 
Right. Now, a lot of native applications on, on, for example, Android and iPhone applications, they work just as well offline as they do online. And the web never really had that. Now, HTML5 defines something called application cache that will allow for those very great offline experiences. Uh, there are some sites like the Financial Times uh, or offline Gmail that are actually using these features today to create web experiences that are on par with sort of the, the desktop and the mobile apps. Of course, you do need to be online to first load this page. You also need to be online to get new content. But it's better than getting that sort of page not found error when, you know, when you're using this experience. Uh, you can still read a lot of the old stuff that you have. You can couple this with uh, the HTML5 storage APIs and store articles and images and so on in locally to, uh, to use later. It's actually really, really simple to use this. A quick example, I'm not going to go to too much detail. All you need is a list of all your files that, that make up your web application, your website. And then you add that, uh, the reference to that file, in a manifest attribute on the HTML element. So that's really all there is. Uh, the browsers, the modern browsers, will pick that up. They'll see that, oh, there's an app cache, a manifest there. It's going to load all those in your local cache. And then the next time you go to that site, it's pulling that directly out of your local cache. It will actually speed up your pages as well on top of that. So it's a nice benefit. I wrote a, a small demo. Uh, you can check out, once you get these slides, it's on appcachefacts.info. Uh, that's where there's a nice little demo on how this works. And you can set up your browser without the, like, no files in the cache, and then try it out and play around with it. So I urge you to check that out. Um, one thing, I wouldn't call that part of HTML5, but really kind of putting all the pieces together, a responsive design is, is very important. Uh, we're now working with uh, laptops, mobile devices, iPads, uh, tablets and, and all of that. And a great example of responsive design, which tailors the content to your, your specific device, is the Boston Globe. I, you may have all seen that. It's a, it's a fantastic example of, um, of, of that in action, where you resize the page, and it just scales to the content. Uh, a similar project. Uh, we just started. So as you know, I wrote this book, uh, Pro HTML5 Programming. And the publisher, A-Press, really wanted to do something, especially because it was about HTML5 and CSS and all of these great things. But it was still just a book, a, a static print book. So I said, well, we really like to do something with that uh, content. Can we practice what you're preaching in this book and actually turn it into an HTML5 experience? And so um, Jen Simmons and Chris O'Connor uh, and Dylan Wooders at APRES, they got together and built this incredible uh, experience to you know, take that book content, the stuff you will find. Actually, let me take one step back. The stuff you'll find in the print version, the ebook version, but actually go a step further and make it interactive. And actually, interesting to look at the sort of the history here. It actually started with uh, this sort of there's a library called uh, TurnJS, which actually turns all your pages, all your content into a, a book. And while that was pretty good, it doesn't scale, it doesn't scale very well, right? So it's more like, OK, now you've turned an actual book into a web book. And yeah, that, that just wasn't quite uh, there. And let's see here. The next step was we went to something called TreeSaver. See if that's working. So still had the, sort of the same idea. You, you have pages, and you move around from page to page. It's more responsive, though, so the, the content will scale. But at that point, it's like, well, why don't we just get, well, OK, it doesn't scale too well. But, uh, sorry. Um, but at that point, it was more, why don't we just abandon this whole book concept? Like, we're building an HTML5 site. Like, let's give people what they really need to do. So uh, this is the latest prototype. So again, uh, this is a first for this conference. It hasn't been shown anywhere. Uh, the exact plans that APRES has, I can't really comment on quite yet. But this is something, sort of a general direction of making 
print content available in a much more interactive way. And so here's the book, the, the, the home page. There's a little video that I recorded. And now you're in the book, and you can very quickly jump around. So let's say I go to the Canvas API chapter. You'll notice that if I were to go offline now, I won't do that for the demo, uh, all of this content is there. In fact, I have uh, the same content here on a Nexus 7. Uh, this Nexus 7, I showed it to a person here before, it has the same content. This Nexus 7 is not online. So it's using application cache to fetch all those resources, and then you can have the entire experience offline. This is great for when you're on the airplane and not every single tab in your browser <laughs> uh, errors out. So now I'm in this, in this document, so I have um, this sort of responsive design. So let, let's take a look at that. So it, it scales to whatever form factor I may be using at the time, even a, an iPhone. That's something very small that probably wouldn't be a great experience anyway. But one of the things that um, I can go here, work with paths, and one thing that I'm very excited about is this feature where we're actually using Canvas and a built-in JavaScript code editor to have interactive code examples. So you're in here, you're either on your tablet or on a device, and you can change here. You can change things and see them happening in real time. So you're actually taking that code and you're working with that. And all of that sort of packaged up in a nice book format. I think it's, it's a, a pretty compelling use case, throwing all those concepts together. Of course, it's also using the HTML5 video and, and other things. OK. Now, uh, a new sort of era is coming with, with more and more touch devices. We've seen the, the Microsoft the Service tablet. Uh, Google just came out with the Chromebook. Uh, the, it's called the Pixel, which is a touch device. And I have one, I have one here. Um, I'm not going to attempt to, during the middle of this presentation, switch to that one. But afterwards, definitely come up, and you can see the same demos in action. So let's um, quickly going to go to this site. And I'll show you a couple of quick examples here. This experiment shows switching between mouse and touch mode on a touchscreen laptop. This is done by uh, one of my colleagues, Boris Smoos, who has written some really great articles on sort of like these new paradigms, right? He calls it responsive input, because you're now dealing with devices that have not only touch, not just like a tablet where you're just touching, but you're touching and you have a keyboard. And it's making some new kinds of experiences possible. So let me just let him explain that. When I use the touch screen, touch screen, the buttons get bigger. When I switch to mouse, they get smaller. So that's sort of a response to detecting that somebody's touching the screen. OK, I've got that. Now, when you're in a touch mode, you're going to need uh, larger buttons, right? You need to be able to, it's, it's much more, much less precise the, than, than the mouse. So you, you need to change that. So that he's built that example here, and I'll have a link to that as well. This is a good one. This experiment shows adding markers to a map via the touch screen and navigating the map by panning and zooming using the trackpad. There's one more here. Mm -hmm. All right, this is pretty good. In this so experiment, I, I can manipulate an object on the screen by a combination of selection via the touch screen and so here you can see a touch as well as two finger swipe and one finger swipe together, making for some really interesting uh, possibilities for, for example, architectural drawings and stuff. You, you want to get in there and you want to control it a little bit more. So things like that are becoming manipulation uh, via the trackpad. Okay. One finger rotates the object and two fingers scales it. Uh, so Microsoft's done some great work with uh, pointer event specification. So uh, there are some 
what we call polyfill libraries as well, pointer, JS, and there's a few more happening right now that sort of um, merge a lot of these different events that, that touch the keyboard, everything together into a, a single unified um, way to interact. So that's, that's some really um, good stuff on that. Here's a, a, a demo again on Boris's site that uh, you can do. Of course, I can't really do that here. Um, well, I can do it with the mouse, but I, I can't do the multi-touch here. Uh, you would need a, an actual touch display for that. One quick way, though, for if you're interested, in the Chrome developer tools, we have a nice way to, it's called overrides. And you can actually emulate touch events with your, like, with the mouse, right? So you can at least get pretty close to what it would be like if you had touch. So you, you would then just get this uh, experience. So uh, pretty, pretty good idea that you know, if you don't have a touch device, you can <laughs> at least uh, try it out. Okay. Um, another sort of approach to this sort of the touch input, uh, is, this is a pretty good one. It's a WebGL bookcase. And in the Google office in New York, we actually have like a complete display, like a, an actual huge touch screen or three huge touch screens that uh, allow you to actually touch those. And then when you get the book you want, you can, so it'll take just a second to, to load up here. <clears throat> All right, so I might uh, pick this. Here's a, a completely new way. And of course, on a touch display, it would work even better, but I might, you know, Pick this Ubuntu 10.10 handbook, and now I can I can start reading it. There's a QR code that so if if you're on the touch window display, you can just scan that and it gets you into your your reader. So really interesting ways of navigating this kind of large amount of content in a much more um, <clears throat> in, a, in a much easier to digest way. Okay. And this is the picture of the, the, the New York office where we have this, where you can actually uh, just spin it around by hand. It's, it's pretty cool. And it's running on, on Chrome, uh, Chromebooks. OK. <clears throat> so beyond touch, a couple of other things I want to point out. And then I'll talk briefly about some of the um, developer tools. And then uh, I think we're running out of time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. So OK, good. So, there are a couple of things that I wanted to show that are they're starting to land in browsers. This is pretty cutting edge, but it's still nice to know where things are going because the things that were cutting edge two years ago are now commonplace. And so uh, here's an example of um, something that Chris Wilson uh, built. Um, it's a great demo of uh, what is called MIDI support. So he's working on a specification. It's called the Web MIDI. So if you have a MIDI device, for example, this sort of little DJ uh, mixer board, and my son is a DJ, but I'm not, <laughs> um, you can control that, so basically over USB into the browser, and, and I, can, I can control that here. And I can start another one. You can do both, of course, but you don't need to. <laughs> oh, this one's still running. <laughs> there. So uh, really cool ways to get device access into your, uh, into your web experience. So you might imagine that maybe at some point this, this would be with a touch device. Of course, you could do all these things on here. That may not be the kind of experience that most professional DJs would want. They might still want this. But having this access to over MIDI directly to your browser uh, it sort of mitigates that whole point. So you can do both. Of course, you can try all this out on a touch device, and it will work equally well. But it's still quite different from that very tactile feel. Now, speech input. This is something I'm really excited about. This is the kind of thing that, that we should have had years ago. But it's really happening right now. It's really something you can start using in browsers. Uh, this is 
sure, not in all browsers yet, but the kind of thing where when you have web audio and you have audio input and you can take that audio input and then do things like round trip it to a speech server that can detect what you're doing, that's really um, pretty exciting. So let me see if that works. OK. I'm really excited to talk about HTML5 today. There. <laughs> there. <laughs> actually, what's really good, uh, I'm going to leave that to you to do, but um, it actually detects swear words. And it will actually start them out in real time. So uh, I won't do that here. <laughs> but it is quite, uh, makes for a good demo, too. <laughs> Uh, Gamepad API. I'm, uh, I didn't bring a PlayStation controller, but if you uh, hook up a USB uh, PlayStation or Xbox controller and you play this Google Doodle, this is quite fun. You can, um, you can at this point, I'm doing that with keyboard. I'm terrible at hurdles. <laughs> <laughs> See, so it's even giving me tips. <laughs> there. Ah, yeah. <laughs> So anyway, so I, I, can, I can just knock them all over. So this is where you need one of those game pads, right? So, and yeah, 25 seconds. So you can probably beat that um, with one hand. But the, the, the point is that all of these devices, uh, the, this sort of device access, whether that be a game pad or a MIDI device, uh, all of this is very easy now to sort of integrate and so the, the web experience of that becomes so much more, uh, more fun. OK. So you might wonder, you know, what sort of tools are we, um, do we have to use for developing HTML5? And, and uh, this is one of my favorite, uh, this is my favorite robot dinosaur. His name is Fake Grimlock. I don't know if you know him. He's a, like a lean startup advisor sort of persona. What's, what's really cool about, um, he's got some great quotes, but I, I, I like this one. If UX not code, no good at web. What, 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 what I make out of that is these days, the process of going from an, an, a design to a working website is quite different from what it used to be, or it can be. And with the, the, the dawn of these incredible developer tools, and if you haven't looked at these developer tools, you really owe it to yourself to take a, a closer look at that. Uh, I mentioned that, for example, I was, this whole presentation is an HTML5 presentation. And so if you hit um, these shortcuts, uh, in this case it's a Mac command option I, then you open the uh, Chrome developer tools. And this is the same shortcut for all the other browsers as well. They have, every one has their own set of um, browser developer tools. And you see that there's a whole bunch of tabs. And you know, for example, here I can select my image. I can just grab it here. And then I can just add uh, border and uh, green there. Now I've changed that page, right? Of course, it's not saved on the server. But it's actually quite easy if I go to the resources to set it up to where I can save locally. So I can actually develop in the browser. And more and more of the sort of prototyping and design can actually happen quite comfortably in the browser. And you can have a great view in, into all these different areas, even deeper, like the timeline and profiles. I won't get into detail here. But there's a lot of things you can do in those tools that gives you great insights and on-the-fly modifications that really make it a powerful experience. And one that I really like is th this one. This is in Firefox. Let me just fire that up a second. So Firefox is a 3D model of any website. So I have this here. I do, uh, again, same shortcut, Command, Option, I. And then I go into this 3D model view. And then this is using the WebGL that I talked about earlier. And let's see here. Oh yeah, here's the, here's the conference website. <laughs> That's pretty cool, right? So it, it, 
kind of fun. Uh, I've seen some websites that look more like the shape of the library. <laughs> this one is very nicely organized. <laughs> but uh, go and try this out on, on sites like Facebook when you're logged in or some very complex site and it's like massive. So it's not that it really means anything necessarily, but it's kind of fun to see this. And sometimes you see things sticking out and it's like they point you at possible problems in your site that, that you wouldn't otherwise have, have seen. So a pretty cool view of the, the web world here. OK. Uh, other, the final thing I wanted to mention, uh, if you want to try some of these features. So in Chrome, we have uh, three channels. So there's the, the stable channel that you download if you get Chrome. There's a beta channel that you can sort of upgrade to and a developer channel. They get more and more adventurous. Uh, also something that I mentioned or that you, you, I've seen shown side by side, uh, Chrome Canary. So that's actually something that is like the most cutting edge thing, sort of a nightly build, if you will. That one can be installed side by side. So you can actually experiment with a lot of these things in a separate browser and leave your regular browser alone. So that, that's kind of nice. So you have that. And in all of those versions, there are experimental flags that you can turn on. If you go to Chrome colon slash slash flags, uh, you can turn these on. For example, the, the web MIDI or web audio, when it first is released, it's usually released behind a flag, something that's like, well, let's have people play around with it, but we don't just turn it on for everyone yet. So definitely check that out. If some of these features that I'm showing here aren't working, Check it in a different version of the browser, and if that doesn't work, maybe there's a flag that you need to set. Sometimes that can really kind of trip you up. So, um, so I wanted to end it there. I have I have plenty of time for questions and all of that. Just repeat the question. Yes, sure, sure. Uh, just a couple of quick notes. Uh, San Francisco Eight and Five User Group. Uh, definitely, we we record all of our events. So even if you're in Seattle, you can still. Uh, sign up and hear when all of our events. And we have, like Joe said, every month an event. We have about 6,500 members now. It's really big. Um, Google Developers Live, this is where we air a lot of our live shows. Uh, the book, uh, we just launched a course on Udacity about HTML5 game programming. And that's it. <laughs> Thanks.